Welcome back. We're right now in the fat biosynthesis playlist. And what we're actually going to do in this video is we're going to look at the biosynthesis of a molecule called malonyl-CoA. And what we have to realize about malonyl-CoA is that's the molecule that's going to be used to build fatty acids. Okay, And fatty acid biosynthesis is something that humans do. It's something that all mammals do. In fact, all organisms are able to biosynthesize fatty acids. And the building block from which they synthesize it is acetyl-CoA. But in order to build the fatty acid, the acetyl-CoA has to be converted into a different molecule, molecule called malonyl-CoA. Okay, so the molecule we're going to look at is uh, malonyl S-CoA, okay? And all malonyl CoA is, is it's a carboxylated version of acetyl-CoA. So if this is our coenzyme A right here, this right here would be acetyl-CoA, right? But when we have malonyl CoA, it's going to have this extra carboxylate group right here. So that molecule that I've shown is malonyl CoA. And that's the molecule that we use to biosynthesize fats, specifically our fatty acids, okay? Let's talk about what all biotin-dependent carboxylases require. Number one, they all require adenosine triphosphate, so that's the first thing. And one thing um, that sort of goes along with enzymes that require adenosine triphosphate is they're going to have this magnesium 2-plus ion that's sort of chelated there in the active site, ordinarily by aspartate residues. And the magnesium, keep in mind, has a positive charge. And it's able to um, be chelated on one side by those aspartate residues. But on the other side, it sort of holds the ATP in there through electrostatic interactions. Okay, So that's one of the things that allows the ATP to stay in there. And as we'll find um, later on in the mechanism, we're going to produce an inorganic phosphate. That will also be held in there due to electrostatic interactions with the magnesium ion. So when we say ATP, we're generally also in implying magnesium. Magnesium, okay, and obviously, if you're a biotin-dependent carboxylase, you also require biotin, okay. And the biotin that you that 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 is here is going to be this that I highlight in light blue, okay. This part right here, this is the biotin, okay. That's the biotin, and what you'll notice is that it has this carboxylic acid derivative right here, which is an amide. And that nitrogen right here that I'm going to circle in red, this nitrogen is the epsilon amine of a lysine residue. So this right here, this is a lysine residue, okay? And of course, it comes off of the carboxylase, okay? In other words, you can say that the biotin is in an amide linkage to a lysine residue in the active site, okay? That's important to realize. So that amide linkage, in other words, is is a linkage between the epsilon amine of a lysine in the active site and a carboxylate um, of the biotin itself. Okay, And there are enzymes called biotinylases or biotin ligases that will ultimately um, ligate the biotin onto the lysine residues. Okay, So that's done by a separate activity. Okay, And we won't consider that here. Okay, And the third thing that is required by all of these enzymes is going to be bicarbonate. Okay, and the structure of bicarbonate is shown right here. Okay, and in fact, when we look at malonyl CoA, okay, this this I'll do this in blue. Actually, let me let me do it in green. This carbon right here, this is ultimately the carbon that's going to get donated to specific molecules. Um, for instance, if we were looking at propionyl CoA carboxylase, that's the carbon, the carbon in green. That's the carbon that forms the carboxyl group on succinyl CoA. Right? In other words, you can say that these carboxylases are transferring this carboxyl group right here. Okay, So this carbon that's in green, this is the carbon that's going to get donated to specific molecules. Okay, In the context of acetyl-CoA carboxylase, okay, that carbon is ultimately going to come from this carbon of bicarbonate. So that carbon that I highlighted in green on bicarbonate, that's the same carbon that's here in malonyl-CoA. Okay, and notice all malonyl CoA is is it's a carboxylated acetyl CoA. Okay, the actual carboxylation of acetyl CoA will be in the next video. In this video, we're simply going to look at the carboxylation of biotin, and that's why we're going to see this video in other playlists as well. Okay. Now, what I want to mention at this point before we actually get into the organic mechanism of this is that not only 
um, do you have a biotin carboxylase part of this enzyme, but you also have a trans carboxylase. So we can actually divide um, this type of enzyme into two domains. Number one, there's always going to be a biotin, a biotin carboxylase domain. So this constitutes domain one. Okay, and biotin carboxylase, as you'll all often hear it, is the actual domain that's going to um, carboxylate this particular nitrogen right here of the biotin. That's the that's the nitrogen that's going to originally get carboxylated through the mechanism. Okay, and that's done by biotin carboxylase. However, there's a second domain D2, which is called the transcarboxylase transcarboxylase and the transcarboxylase is actually going to transfer that carboxyl group which was on this nitrogen right here it's going to transfer that onto the molecule of choice in the context of this enzyme it would be acetyl coa and we'll see that in the next video now what's important to understand about these enzymes is you sort of have with this within this enzyme you have one activity right here which is biotin carboxylase and you have the second activity, which is the transcarboxylase, okay? So what you have to keep in mind is that if you have your lysine residue right here, so here's your lysine residue, and then we'll say this is our biotin, right? So here's my biotin coenzyme, right, attached to the lysine. In the first state of um, the biotin, it's sort of associated with this biotin carboxylase, but you can sort of view um, the biotin carboxylase domain is being completely separated from the transcarboxylase domain. And so what will happen is in the first step, biotin carboxylase will carboxylate, it will carboxylate the biotin, right, on that nitrogen that I circled in orange, right? And then what's going to happen literally is the lysine is going to rotate and it will orient the biotin into the active site of the transcarboxylase. So the biotin will no longer be in the active site of biotin carboxylase. The lysine literally rotates into the transcarboxylase active site. And so what you'll find there is, let me do this in, in a different color, in purple, here would be the biotin. And then, of course, you'd have the carboxyl group on there, and you transfer the carboxyl group onto acetyl-CoA to make malonyl-CoA. Okay, So I want to make that perfectly clear. The active sites of biotin carboxylase and transcarboxylase are different. Okay, And literally what the lysine functions to do is it ligates the biotin, and it literally rotates to orient the biotin with respect to the first D1 and then to D2. Okay, So they're different active sites. Okay. And oftentimes what you'll see uh, for abbreviation is biotin carboxylase will be BC and the transcarboxylase will be CT oftentimes because it's called carboxytransferase. Okay? I usually call it transcarboxylase though and some textbooks use that as well. Okay, enough boring on that. Okay, Let's actually look at the mechanism because that's actually what's most important about learning um, this enzyme. Okay, I'll do the mechanistic steps in green. Okay. There exists a base in the active site of these um, carboxylases that is unknown. We don't know exactly what the base is. It might very well be a water that's in the active site, but it's really unknown. And you're going, the enzyme is going to allow bicarbonate into the active site, and the base is going to deprotonate bicarbonate. Okay. So at physiological pH, bicarbonate exists with one proton on it. That's um, a function of the pKa's of all of those oxygens. So it's going to have a proton. So the base deprotonates it, and you get um, this double bond rearrangement with this pile, these pi electrons coming out and doing a nucleophilic acyl substitution on the gamma phosphate of ATP. Now, in this step, you would generate a trigonal bipyramidal intermediate, right? But for the for the purpose of simplicity, we're eliminating that step, and we're just going to cause the collapsing of the trigonal bipyramidal intermediate. Um, back to its tetrahedral state with the loss of adenosine diphosphate. And we see that adenosine diphosphate right here. And so we've, what we've effectively done in this step is several things. Number one, um, we have this base that's now protonated, right? The base is protonated, and it will stay that way through the end of the mechanism, okay? Um, we haven't done anything to the biotin yet. That's going to come later. But what we've done now is we've phosphorylated bicarbonate, 
okay and what's going to happen now is we're actually going to generate carbon dioxide so the so the thing about biotin dependent carboxylases is they're really strange in the sense that they don't just use free carbon dioxide they actually have to synthesize it themselves which is very strange so in this step what's going to happen is is these electrons are going to form a carbonyl right here and that's going to expel the phosphate right here okay and so what you generate is this carbon dioxide right here and this carbon dioxide is going to be used to um, attach to the biotin and that will be the source of the carboxyl group on acetyl coa to make malonyl coa okay and of course in the process we generate phosphate however in this state it's po4 3 minus right because none of the oxygens have protons on them but that's going to change in the next step okay one of these oxygens that's oriented closest to the the nitrogen that's distal from this chain right here notice how with respect to this chain there's this nitrogen and then there's this one right the one that's furthest away right the one that's furthest away that's the one that's going to play a role in carboxylating so the phosphate is going to deprotonate that nitrogen and that's going to force a double bond rearrangement that forces an oxygen to have a negative charge and one thing you can sort of view it like is sort of like an enolate right if you had this molecule right here and this is just this is not the same thing but you can sort of view it in a similar way right when you drew the mechanism of uh, for instance an enolate tautomerization right you had some base right you had some base and the base deprotonated this carbon and that forced the double bond right here and um, the pi electrons on the oxygen so what you ended up with was an enolate okay so whenever you drew the mechanism of of nucleophilic attack like let's say let's say you had an electrophile right here okay here's our electrophile when you drew the mechanism you couldn't just draw these electrons right here attacking the electrophile right you had to first show it in the tautomerization then these electrons are going to kick back down and then you get nucleophilic attack on the electrophile, right? The same thing's going to be true here, except for the fact that instead of having a carbon right here, we have a nitrogen. So we're gonna form this sort of pseudo um, enolate, except the, for the fact that it has a nitrogen, okay? And the carbon dioxide is gonna be oriented right next to that nitrogen. And so then the carbonyl bond is going to reform and this shift base um, electron system is going to come out and attack the carbonyl carbon of carbon dioxide and you're going to generate a carboxylated biotin and the carboxylated biotin we see right here now keep in mind we also have this phosphate with a two minus charge in other words it's monoprotic phosphate or dibasic phosphate and then we also have again our carboxylated biotin this mechanistic step right here takes us through the end of what was um, the biotin carboxylase domains mechanism okay remember that from the beginning we had two domains for this enzyme we had a biotin carboxylase and a trans carboxylase okay the biotin carboxylase mechanism is well conserved it's the exact same for every single biotin dependent carboxylase okay however um, what's going to change is the transcarboxylase and really the only thing about the transcarboxylase that changes is the substrate for instance if we were dealing with the enzyme pyruvate carboxylase transcarboxylase's substrate would be pyruvate right if it was propionyl coa carboxylase transcarboxylase's substrate would be propionyl coa in this case our substrate is going to be acetyl coa and we'll look at that mechanism in the next video so in the next video we'll look at transcarboxylase but right now let's do a very quick recap of what we saw so an unknown base in the active site is going to deprotonate bicarbonate forcing nucleophilic attack on the gamma phosphate of ATP forcing an acyl substitution into a trigonal bipyramidal intermediate with loss of adenosine diphosphate is the leaving group and we get a phosphorylated bicarbonate okay and what's going to happen now is you're going to generate carbon dioxide right here with the loss of phosphate and then phosphate is going to deprotonate the nitrogen distal from this valeryl chain right here of the biotin and that's going to force a tautomerization forcing an oxygen up here to have a negative charge that activates 
uh, the pi electrons for nucleophilic attack. So these electrons right here, the ones I'm going to circle, let me do it in red, these electrons right here are activated. Okay, so whenever this carbonyl bond reforms, these electrons that are part of the shift base are able to attack this carbon of carbon dioxide, and that's what ultimately carboxylates biotin. Okay, and one of the one of the, the things about this is I won't go into a whole lot of detail here, but this carbon right here is especially activated electrophilically. Okay, so if you have a nucleophile. Okay, and the nucleophile can come in several forms, but it's usually a carbon with a negative charge. Okay, the nucleophile can attack here, right? And when it attacks this carbon, you're going to get a nucleophilic acyl substitution. So right now, you have a trigonal planar carbon that's going to move up to a tetrahedral intermediate, um, and then you're going to have loss of the leaving group, which in most cases is just going to be the rest of this biotin skeleton. Okay, And we're actually going to see that in the next video, which is going to be on transcarboxylase. See you soon.